So, you know, you want to be a pleasing, appealing to the senses. I'm going to talk to you about sexual allure and platonic appeal too. Platonic, yeah. And, and this is the kind of talk that your doctor ought to have with you to improve your desirability. And so what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is, is uh, talk about some ways to make you more desirable. Uh, why would you want to be more desirable? And well, you'd be more successful if you're more desirable. And uh, what is the um, what is the best chance of being a, a, an attractive person? It's to be a healthy person. Health is attractive. You know, I, ha I have to tell you. Let me start out by a, a little story about my my dad and I. I was very close to my father. And uh, we could have some quite frank conversations. And, you know, I, I remember one day we were walking in a park and there were a lot of lovely women walking by. And, you know, my dad noticed my gaze and he said to me, he says, son, you know, you know, you, 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 you uh, find that woman over there appealing, uh, attractive. And I said, yeah, dad, I do, you know, you noticed. But you didn't find this one over here attractive, did you, son? I said, no, dad, I didn't. He said, do you know why? I said, no, why, dad? He says, do you know what you found appealing? Is this one over here looked healthy and that one didn't. And my comment was, dad, that's not what I was looking at. But it really was. And, and now at my age, I, I can uh, assure you that when you see somebody who's attractive in, in all kinds of relationships, you're looking at health because you want to mingle with healthy people. You want to mingle with healthy people in a platonic relationship because you want to be successful. And then of course you want to mingle with, with healthy people for more passionate relationships, reproductive relationships. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. But the, the whole focus of attention, I don't care whether your, your nose is crooked or one cheek's higher than another, or you even have a scar across your forehead. What people are looking at is a healthy person or an unhealthy person. And that's where attractiveness comes from. Uh, you have a, a couple of ways of detecting health in people. Uh, one is by sight, and we're gonna talk about the other is by odor, smell. And uh, I'd like to deal with those uh, approaches separately. The experiment done where they took about 20 people and what they did is they took pictures of them before and after an injection of a liposaccharide that made them ill. It's a, it's a toxin. And then they showed the facial pictures to an audience of 77 people. And they also, they allowed them to wear t-shirts for a considerable period of time. They soaked their t-shirts in sweat and they asked them to smell and to determine how, how likable these people were. And based upon health, in other words, the pictures that appeared healthy and the odors that smelled healthy, they judged these people as likable or unlikable. So, you know, that's, that's the two senses that you have to judge people around you. Uh, as far as judging people around you and platonic relationships, uh, you want to have healthy people around you because these are people who are more efficient, more productive. They're going to take less days off work, less sick days. They're going to be thinking about their health problems less often, less trips to the doctor's office, etc. In other words, you're going to be dealing with a, a group of people who has a better chance of succeeding in whatever kind of business you're in. And so you're attracted to healthy people. Now, whether or not you find some of the things I say offensive, I, I apologize. But I have to be frank about my discussions. And when I talk about people being unattractive in terms of visual appeal or unattractive in terms of body odor, I'm not trying to be personal. I'm just trying to give you some guidance. Uh, if you are uh, dealing in a business or an educational situation, what we know is that people who are obese are judged as having less leadership potential. They're expected to be less successful they're less competent, they receive a lower salary and they're ranked as less qualified. The difference in salary of an overweight person is about $9,000 a year less 
if you're really big, obese, then it's $19,000. And it goes in other aspects of your life. For example, your opportunity to get a good education, whether you're going to school or you're going to a university for higher education. If you compare people with um, who look healthy as opposed to those who don't, and again, the, the criterion we're looking at here is body fatness. Uh, overweight people are assigned less grades, equal amount of work, equal scores, and they get less grades on the report card. Uh, their judges need an extra help and they're less likely to get into college or other types of higher education. Not fair, but that's the way the world is. So you wanna improve your healthfulness, your appearance to other people so that you're successful in these kinds of endeavors in your life. The other uh, important thing is you want to be healthy when it comes to reproduction. You want to pick a mate that has healthy genes, in other words, healthy sperm and healthy eggs, so that the ultimate outcome is a, is a healthy offspring, is, is a fit offspring. And that's the other reason you want to, it's very important you, you appear healthy to, to other people. Uh, we know, for example, that unhealthy people are uh, less fertile. O obese men and obese women, they have less chance of getting pregnant. And it's just not being overweight. It's being overweight on a high fat, low carbohydrate diet that makes people less fertile. Uh, that could be that could be in this in the in the uh, the area of male reproduction. It could be a problem of erectile dysfunction. You know, people eat the rich Western diet. Uh, they clog up their arteries, not just the arteries to the heart and brain, not just the arteries to their legs, but to the arteries of an organ between their legs. And uh, as a result, men who suffer from erectile dysfunction are those who eat the rich Western diet, who close the arteries to their penis. The way the penis gets hard, it's just made of a spongy material and blood flows in, fills up the spongy material and you have an erection. Now you also, on the other end, you have to have the veins collapse down so that the blood doesn't drain out. And you need healthy nerves to control this type of blood flow. Now they say that if you have erectile dysfunction, that's a canary in the coal mine because it predicts whether you're gonna have other problems with your arteries. You've got 60,000 miles of blood vessels in your body and they're all being diseased at a similar rate. And so men who have erectile dysfunction, <clears throat> they're the ones who have heart attacks, heart surgery, et cetera. Uh, as far as a woman's concerned, she needs to, she needs to appear healthy. Uh, and again, we're talking about body fatness here. Women who are underweight uh, are less fertile. They have a risk of low birth weight babies, high risk babies, more problems with uh, miscarriages and difficulties during their, um, their deliveries. You know, when I, when I started practicing medicine, we were so concerned about the body weight of women <clears throat> when they were pregnant that we used to give them diuretics to, to cause them to lose weight because we knew that overweight women had more problems with pregnancy and had uh, more difficulties with their babies. And so the only way we knew to make them thin was to give them water pills, diuretics. So we also changed our recommendations to women. Back 40, 50 years ago, we used to admonish women for gaining weight during their pregnancy. And as a result, they listened and they starved themselves and they stayed trim and they ended up with low birth weight women. Well, about 40 years ago, we changed our recommendations as physicians because we knew it was a, a poor outcome for the offspring and the mother. And we told women, eat as much as you want. And the result was women gained 40, 50, 60 pounds. So what's the problem here? The problem here is the wrong diet, the wrong food. You, you can't eat too much or too little of it and have things turn out right. What you've got to do is you've got to correct the underlying food to end up with an appetite, which is appropriate for your pregnancy, which obviously increases because you're supporting 
your offspring, your baby, the fetus, and also increased energy needs of pregnancy. Now, when you follow the advice that is given today, because doctors don't know what else to say, you know, they don't want you to be too thin. You end up with too small a baby. They want to avoid that, so they tell you to eat as much as you want. And there's no way of getting around the problem except to change the food. And you end up with too big a body, and the baby grows too big. And the result of a baby being too big is it has difficulty getting out of mom. And the answer to having trouble delivery through uh, the birth canal, which is a problem of cephalo pelvic disproportion. That's what we call it in the medical business. The baby's too big to fit out the birth canal. What happens? You end up having a cesarean section. Babies are big these days. But when I, when I was born, typical baby was five, six, maybe big baby was seven pounds or oh, eight. It's not unusual for a mother to have, deliver a baby that's 8, 10, 12, 14 pounds. They just plain and simple don't fit. The only way you can make it right is you have to start giving the, the correct recommendations on food to a pregnant woman. So there are <clears throat> visual clues uh, to picking a healthy partner. Uh, you want them to be trim. Not, not just trim, but you want them to have a particular uh, kind of trimness where the hips are big and the waist is small. Other ways of judging health in, in a partner is their skin tone. In other words, do they look healthy? You know, there's certain clues and we're gonna talk about those that you get from the skin that indicate whether or not a person is healthy or unhealthy. And we're gonna be talking about those also. The, uh, <clears throat> the reason a woman's uh, hips are big is because that's where she stores the fat for the baby. It's generally more of the correct kind of fat, polyunsaturated fats, than the kinds of fats that are stored around the thorax or the abdomen. A gynecoid fat, we call it. And uh, of course, when you look at a female, uh, you have to judge the opportunities to, to produce a good offspring. And that depends upon whether she stored enough body fat for the baby and herself during pregnancy. And she stores this in her buttocks and her legs, not in her thorax or abdomen, which is android fat. Now, the way we, uh, we decide whether or not a person is attractive, this is a male or female, is uh, experiments are set up uh, with a, a computer program that looks at eye motion. This is called an eye, an eye movement study. And the computer registers where the participant is looking at a particular figure. And what we find, and I'm gonna to talk to you about males looking at females here primarily, but the same thing applies to males, is that uh, the most attention that's given is when uh, they have a particular waist hip ratio. And an ideal waist hip ratio is about 0.7, in other words, your waist would be 28 inches and hips would be 40 inches. Higher ratios, in other words, uh, bigger waist, smaller hips, less attractive, older looking. Of course, any good experiment would look at breast size to decide how important that is in terms of attractiveness of males to females. And you know, quite honestly, uh, breast size is not as important as waist hip ratio. I don't know, except by plastic surgery, how to make breasts bigger. But I certainly know how to make waist smaller. And we'll talk about that. So what you have control over is you have control over your waist hip ratio. What we find is that, as I mentioned, breast size is less important. And uh, the ideal breasts are the ideal thing to look at in the, the, the the observation that it uh, tells you whether you're more likely to have a successful offspring pregnancy is the waist hip ratio. And uh, if you have a proper and ideal waist hip ratio, small waist, larger hips, you have three times the risk of, or the chance of getting pregnant. And this has to do with also female hormones that are present. And we find that women who have ideal waist hip ratios 
have a, a proper amount of their female hormones, estrogens and progesterones. Let's take a look at some waist hip ratios that have changed by following a healthy diet. I don't have to say much, but uh, losing 90 pounds. To be subjective, I would say this is a more appealing waist hip ratio. I hope you agree. Took her a while to lose the weight, but she eventually lost 150 pounds. But look at the waist hip ratio and 110 pounds. Do you see the difference? 149 pounds. These are all accomplishments uh, based on the type of recommendations that I offer to women and men. Again, an improvement in the waist hip ratio. Same thing for men, even though it, uh, you know, the, the objective beautification of, of men is, uh, is less often talked about, but, but, but women find men more appealing who have a more ideal waist, waist hip ratio. Lost 265 pounds. You can see the improvement. Lost 166 pounds. I realize I'm being subjective, folks. The uh, recommendations that I offer people in terms of losing weight are very effective. Uh, we did a study of 1,703 people over a 10 year period of time who went through my clinic where I teach a starch based diet. And the average weight loss in seven days was 3.1 pounds. Men lost a little bit more than women. And then we did a one year study, and this was done here in Portland, Oregon Health and Science University. And at a year, the average weight loss was over 19 pounds. And then our diet was studied in New Zealand. And the people from New Zealand, uh, they brag about how they have the greatest long-term weight loss of any program out there. And the uh, average weight loss was uh, a little over 25 pounds, maintained for a year. Uh, let's talk about some other aspects of food and why you want to pick a good mate. Let's talk about having high quality genes. Uh, if you eat the Western diet, you end up taking chemicals that cause birth defects. Some of you will be able to relate to this, but these same chemicals, which have an estrogen type stimulation result in a decreased ejaculate volume. Think about it. Low sperm count, short sperm life, poor mobility of the sperm, genetic damage, infertility is the result. And these are from the foods. And you wanna choose someone who is most likely to have, have the most uh, healthy genes, don't you? We use visual clues and clues that you obtain by smelling the odor to pick a healthy person who's most likely to share with you good genes. These chemicals, they also have an effect of the, on the baby when, when the baby's in utero and it results in undesirable outcomes as when a woman eats a diet high in estrogen stimulating chemicals, what happens is the baby ends up with a smaller penis, the male, the male offspring and smaller testicles. And birth defects result as a consequence of eating the rich American diet with its estrogenic compounds. There's a condition where the urethra, instead of opening at the end of the penis, opens at the base of the penis. Serious malformation, it's called hypospadia. And also you suffer from undescended testicles, one or both, as a consequence of the, the estrogenic compounds that are consumed on the rich Western diet. Down syndrome, study done where they compared folate intake, folate, that's folate, foliage plants with the, uh, the chance of having a baby with trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. And these chemicals, they damage both the female and the male in the genetic material so that they end up having children with Down syndrome. 
all kinds of chemicals. They damage the genes and they have this estrogenic effect. And they, they come initially into the environment through common things we, that we use every day. Plastics and epoxy resins, food storage containers, plastics and herbicides and all kinds of different substances that you run into on a daily basis, which by the way, you're taught are quite safe, they're not. And if you're a scientist or you're very concerned about the subject, you realize that these xenoestrogens, estrogen disruptors they're called, cause a tremendous amount of harm to you and your offspring. The way that these uh, gene damaging chemicals get into your system is through biomagnification, where the body bioaccumulates the chemicals. Th these chemicals are fat soluble. In other words, they're attracted by your body fat and they're concentrated a hundredfold, a thousandfold, 10,000 times fold as you move up the food chain. So you start out with a little bit of uh, a gene damaging chemical or estrogen stimulating chemical on the plant foods and you eat a lot of them, or the, let's start with the cow. The cow eats tons of these plant-derived chemicals, and then the cow uh, stores the, the harmful chemicals in the cow's body fat. And then we turn out around and eat 150 pounds of cow a year. And all the chemicals in that cow fat is concentrated in your fat. And the end of the food chain is the baby suckling off of mother's breast. There was a study done in, in 1972 where they looked at the breast milk of 1,400 women from 48 states. And because of this process of bioaccumulation in the woman's body, they declared breast milk a health hazard. Now, when you get pregnant, uh, through the changes that occur during pregnancy and the, the milk you produce, you dump about half of your pesticide load into your infant within six months. So you wanna be as clean as possible. And how do you be as clean as possible? You eat low on the food chain, you eat the plants and avoid the animals. Let's uh, talk about skin and hair for a minute as far as attractiveness, as far as trying to pick people you wanna be with for platonic relationships. In other words, business and education and also uh, closer relationships where you uh, are in a, a situation where you, you're reproducing. You're trying to get the healthiest offspring possible by sharing healthy eggs and healthy sperm with each other. Clues. Uh, have you ever heard the term in the pink? Well, have you ever heard about applying rouge, particularly to a woman's face? Why is this color appealing? It's because it indicates good health. It indicates effective circulation. Red blood is oxygenated blood. Blue blood is after it occurs in the veins and it's after the oxygen has been delivered to the tissues. The blood cells turn blue. And so what you're looking at is you're looking at effective circulation when you look at somebody's skin tone, when you eat a high fat diet, animal fat or vegetable fat, what happens is the blood cells, which normally bounce off each other, start to hit and stick and form clumps. About an hour after a fatty meal, you see the blood cells starting to stick together. About four hours after the meal, the blood cells are so clumped up, there's hardly any circulation at all. We call this Rolo formation. And the circulation starts to return about six hours after your meal. And you're flowing again fine after about 10 to 12 hours. Well, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, most Americans eat a high fat meal every three to four hours. So their blood is constantly in this state of poor circulation. If, if you take and you measure the blood, what you find in a person that the oxygen content of the blood drops by about 20%. We call it oxygen tension. Every nurse, doctor has been involved in checking the arterial blood of their patients. And you can tell how much oxygen is in the blood. Let me show you a dramatic representation of what goes on. 
Uh, here you have uh, the blood cells oxygenated, red, flowing by very rapidly. It's because the, red, the blood cells uh, repel each other. And then what happens when you eat the fatty meal is the cells get coated with fat and they no longer repel and they stick together in clumps. And this clumping, this, this poor circulation results in blue blood. And you can detect that on a person's skin. And the circulation finally returns about 10 to 12 hours later. But, but I wanna to mention to you that when you feed vegetable fat to subjects, the sludging, the impaired circulation is more severe and lasts longer than it would be with animal fat. Here it is in uh, some research, and there are quite a few of these studies done back in the 1960s, 1970s. What they did in this particular experiment is they took uh, several men. This happens to be a 44-year-old fireman. And they looked at the circulation in this particular man, apparently healthy, by looking at the whites of the eye. You know, when you come home from a tough night, you look in the mirror and you've got bloodshot eyes, that's what you're looking at. And you see the conjunctiva, the whites of the eye, in the frame on the left, and you see a lot of blood vessels, good circulation. In this case, uh, the fireman is fed a meal that contains 67% of the calories as fat. And four hours later, you have this dramatic change in circulation that occurs. Blood vessels disappear. Why? Because the vessels themselves are transparent. The only reason you can see them is when red blood cells flow through them. When there's no more flow through a vessel, it disappears. 67% fat meal. What this man had for breakfast was two eggs, four strips of bacon, milk, cream, bread, and two pats of butter. You ever eat that? I'll bet you have. I would guess so. That was a typical breakfast of mine, I know. The other way you can judge the health of a person is by their complexion, blackheads, whiteheads, and acne. Now, everybody's told that diet has nothing to do with acne. You know, any patient who has acne, blackheads, whiteheads, uh, all they have to do is ask their doctor, does diet have anything to do with acne? And the doctor will confidently tell them that, no, absolutely not, it's been proven scientifically. The diet has nothing to do with acne. This is based on one study published in the Journal of American Medical Association in 1969 by James Fulton. What they did is they took 30 adolescents who were attending an acne clinic and uh, 35 young male prisoners who had mild, moderate, severe acne. And then they fed them candy bars, which happened to be donated by the Chocolate Manufacturers Association, it was kind to them. And one candy bar, they added chocolate, the other was without chocolate. But you look at the fat content of both bars, it was actually the same. And what they did is they counted the number of pimples that occurred, whether or not you ate high fat, chocolate, high fat candy, either with or without chocolate, and decided that acne had nothing to do with diet. That's the total evidence. Ask your dermatologist. And the suffering that goes on for people who have bad complexions, I'm sure you can relate. What happens is the, uh, the fat, whether it is in a candy bar that you eat that is uh, with or without chocolate, the, the fat ends up on the skin. And there are bacteria on your skin that eat these kinds of fats and they cause inflammation. And as a result, you get a pustule and you get the pimple. So the more fat you eat, the more fat you have on your skin. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. We've talked about that. You wear it under your skin. And of course we call that overweight or obesity. And you wear it on your skin and we call that greasy hair and greasy skin that feeds pimples. And the Nelson twins, good longtime friends of mine, the Nelson family. And the daughters who are professional models who work in advertising, and of course their skin is very important to them. Uh, they went on a, a vacation to Europe and got away from their typical vegan low fat diet. 
and they got into big trouble. They didn't know what to do. You can see Rhonda's and Nina's uh, complexions while well, they're on the vacation. And so I happened to have a chance to remind them because they knew, remind them that they had to be strict to clear up their complexion. And so they did, and it cleared up right away. And they were so excited about their success as they've written a book, a national best-selling book, The Clear Skin Diet, a six-week program of beautiful skin. And I had the opportunity to write the foreword to this book, just like your book, Chef AJ. One last visual clue, and again, you know, I, I risk treading on some of your perceptions, uh, and you may disagree with what I have to say, but is male pattern baldness. Male pattern baldness, men that are bald look older and they're just as less attractive. This first came to my attention back in 1985 when I was in practice in Kailua, Hawaii. Uh, there was a dermatologist who was a friend of mine who worked in my same office building who gave me a paper written by a Dr. Inaba. It was titled, Can Human Hair Grow Again? And I laughed. I knew he was teasing me, but was he? Uh, Dr. Inaba, a Japanese physician of, of note, what he did is he observed uh, what happened to, to men in Japan pre and post World War II. Prior to World War II, the Japanese male was not bald. After World War II, when they changed their diet, male pattern baldness became common. And we see that in all Asian populations these days. And it's reported that the Asian who was typically full headed in hair, who lived on a diet of rice and vegetables, very low fat, very low animal products maintain their hair for a lifetime. And now you find that Asians are just as bald as whites and blacks. Now I was living in Hawaii at that time and I had a chance to, to confirm whether or not this was true. And living in Hawaii, we went to Waikiki a lot and we would see various generations of Japanese men. And the older Japanese male always had a full set of hair, but the Japanese males who were who were descendants living in Hawaii, who had already switched to the West Western diet, as I say, suffered from a severe male pattern baldness. Male pattern baldness, whether you like it or not, and I know many of you are sitting out there thinking, I love bald men, okay. But if you ask people and passionately about how they feel about it in scientific studies, they find baldness physically less attractive. And not just as far as a uh, sexual reproductive issue, but also in social interactions. Men with uh, full sets of hair are, are, are judged more favorably. Uh, you know, Dr. Anaba, I, I just kind of, like I say, I really wasn't convinced until I thought about the effects of the rich Western diet on hormones. I knew about the effects of the rich Western diet on female hormones. When you eat a rich Western diet, you increase the amount of estrogens in your body for a whole bunch of reasons that are well elucidated. And one of the reasons is that feeding the rich Western diet causes people to gain weight and fat cells make estrogen. They take adrenal hormones and they convert them into estrone, which is a potent estrogen. And I applied this same type of thinking of changes in hormones that take place to what I was observing in males losing their hair. You know, loss of hair has to do with male hormones, androgens. And you know this because you see advertisements for, for hair loss re restoration programs. And one of the most common things they use are, are chemicals that, uh, that deactivate the male hormones, the androgens. Proscar and Propecia are a couple of the typical ones that neutralize the male hormone, the androgen. Uh, before we leave this subject, let me talk about one other thing that is physically unattractive, and that's uh, what occurs secondary to years of constipation. P 
picture for a minute uh, the typical American sitting on the toilet, trying to pass the rock hard fecal marbles that are produced by eating a low fiber, high animal food diet. What is this person doing? They're grunting and groaning and straining and their faces turn all red, putting a tremendous amount of effort in to get that little rock hard fecal marble out to see fresh air. And not only do they push blood up into the face, they push blood into other parts of the body and they push blood into the hemorrhoidal veins. The hemorrhoidal veins are veins that provide cushions so that uh, stool and gas doesn't leak at inappropriate times. Very effective cushions. And when you grunt and groan and strain, you dilate these veins and they end up hanging out your butt. This is not attractive. The other detraction that occurs as a consequence of eating a rich Western diet is varicose veins. Varicose veins are not due to sitting on cold toilet seats. Varicose grain veins are due to grunting and groaning and straining and putting a tremendous amount of back pressure on the veins in your legs, they dilate. And these veins in the legs, they have, they have valves that get damaged and destroyed. So you have these uh, high pressure columns of blood, back pressure in the veins and they dilate into blue worms and you end up with varicose veins. Uh, let's talk about the other way to a distance judge somebody as far as healthfulness, not just vision, but there's also odor. Smell is very sensitive at judging health as well as sickness, just as we started this conversation. When they injected uh, people with endotoxins and they made them sick and they asked 77 volunteers to determine their, their likeness, their appeal, they found those that were sick were unappealing. And the sense of smell is so specific that, that you can detect whether or not somebody is ill for problems such as cancer, lung, breast, and bladder cancer. You can determine whether or not they have metabolic disorders like diabetes, liver disease, asthma, and kidney disease. They all have a particular odor. You know this, you know about the sense of smell. You are impressed by the fact that dogs can be trained to detect cancer just by a sniff. Lung cancer has been studied quite, quite extensively and has been able to detect various kinds of cancer, including lung cancer. Well, you know, dogs, that's a lot of work to train a dog. It takes about 12 months to train a dog to sniff and to identify sickness as opposed to health. The newer research involves insects, flies and ants. And they, they can train them in about 30 minutes and they have a much more refined sense of smell. And so by applying different substances to the insect's environment and looking at their behavior, you find that insects are even more specific as far and more sensitive as far as identifying sickness and distinguish it from health. Of course, insects are cheap too. The uh, connection between, between odor and your emotions has an anatomical basis. Uh, those of you who are, remember your neuroanatomy, you remember the fact that chemicals come into the body via the, uh, the air through the nose. And, and these chemicals, they react with uh, what we call uh, hairs. They're not really hairs, they're nerves. And these nerves, uh, you can see them right here. You see these, these nerves, uh, they're stimulated and the message from these nerves based on, upon various odors goes directly into a lobe of the brain. This is not a nerve, this is a part of the brain. And this stalk of the brain called the olfactory lobe, it is a direct connection to the limbic system. That's a part of the brain right here, right here that determines emotion, determines your sense of love and sexual desire, hunger, pleasure, pain. You know this, you, you, you've, you've heard about this. You, you probably have heard that men prefer the smell of women when they're most fertile. 
And if a woman takes uh, oral contraceptives, her appeal is dramatically decreased. Well, the sense of smell as detected by your nose can discriminate between gender, whether you're a male or female, the person that you're, that, that you're smelling can determine their uh, relationship status as far as whether they're married or not married, detects illness, self-esteem, and temporarily it can detect emotional states such as fear, disgust, and anxiety. I, I remember, uh, Steve was his name. He was an FAA instructor. A and Mary took our Baron and she was getting her IFR rating with the Baron. It was a tough day for her. And uh, she passed. She got her IFR rating, instrument flight rating. And uh, she was capable and enjoyed very much flying the Baron. But right after she got back from this excruciating, stressful, fear-laden examination, I got into the airplane. And I could smell the fear. It's very distinct. I didn't even ask, I asked her what she went through during that examination, because it was all present there in the odor of the atmosphere of the inside of our barren. So uh, what you eat uh, results in a whole bunch of body odors, breath, and as many as half people think that they have halitosis, odor of the skin, body odor, which occurs in the armpits and also the pubic area, area of the body, pubic area, is the apocrine glands and they have to do with sexual interest. How you smell determines whether you like a person or not, or you wanna be sexually involved with them. What you eat also determines the odor of uh, more intimate fluids like semen and vaginal secretions. it results in odor of your urine, depending on what you eat. Any of you who are sensitive to asparagus, you know about uh, the odor that occurs as a consequence of eating this vegetable. It's not from the amino acid asparagine. It's another product of, of the asparagus that causes this very distinct odor in the urine. And of course, uh, there's the, um, the end product of odor, which is uh, the flatus, you know, bad farts sticky farts. So you have, uh, you have these body odors produced as a consequence of what you eat. And there are a couple of specific odors I want to talk to you about. It's the odor of uh, sulfur, hydrogen sulfide, and also the odor that's, uh, that is what we call a fishy odor due to trimethylamine. These kind of odors occur as a consequence of the foods that you eat. And what we're talking about specifically is when you eat animal foods, you end up stinking like sulfur and stinking like rotting fish, all the way from your breath down to your, your reproductive fluids. You recognize the, the foul odor of, uh, of sulfur. Sulfur is probably the most disgusting of all odors that the human being comes in contact with. Sulfur is a consequence of what you eat. In particular, the sulfur containing amino acids. There are 20 amino acids that form all the proteins in nature, all the proteins in elm trees, giraffes, hippopotamus, ants, flies. Every protein in nature, elm trees, is created by the same 20 amino acids rearranged in different sequences, just like all the words in a dictionary are created by rearranging 26 different letters. When you eat a high protein diet, you eat a diet high in amino acids. And the, some of these amino acids contain sulfur. These are methionine and cysteine. And as a consequence, eating these sulfur containing amino acids, you stink. You stink like rotten eggs. You, you stink like the, the sulfur pits that you enjoyed or didn't enjoy at Yellowstone Park or when you went to Hawaii. Disgusting. There's also the fish odor. This has uh, recently been discovered and talked about over the last 10 years. 
based on research in uh, connection with heart disease. In experimental studies, uh, what's found is that when you uh, feed a person carnitine or choline, which are ingredients in animal foods, or you can buy them as supplements, supplements, is these, uh, these substances, these basic substrates are converted by bacteria. They grow in the intestinal tract in meat eaters into trimethylamine. Then the, and that stinks, trimethylamine stinks. People who have trimethylamine ure, uh, uh, meteuria, which is a, a very serious condition. They call that fish odor syndrome. You smell like rotten fish. And that's trimethylamine, the liver, converts it into a much less odorous substance called trimethylamine oxide. And what we find is that people who have high levels of trimethylamine and trimethylamine oxide in their body end up with ravages of atherosclerosis, damaged arteries throughout their body. Well, vegans don't do this. Vegans don't take, even when you feed them meat or supplements because of the kind of bacteria that grow in their intestinal tract, they don't convert the carnitine and the choline into trimethylamine. Vegans don't do that because of the bacteria that grows in their intestinal tract. Uh, so what do we do with these, uh, these, these disgusting, offensive odors? We try and cover them up. Toothpaste, mouthwashes, deodorants, and, and, and now there are feminine hygiene products that are advertised to people men and women, with the idea that somehow this is gonna make them more attractive. But unfortunately, these are just cover-ups and the odors are so profound, so fundamental, that whether you perceive them at one level, they're always in the background. You gotta get rid of the stink. So how do you get rid of the stink? Well, you can uh, take a new brand of mouthwashes that tells you that, uh, like smart mouth, they tell you right in the advertisement that we have a mouthwash that deactivates the sulfur because sulfur that stinks. And our mouthwash will, will deactivate it so it doesn't smell. You know, sulfur is an element, it's neither created or destroyed. It just, it just deactivates it with these kinds of mouthwashes. Well, that's one way to deal with it. But I, I think there's a better way to deal with it. And that is to stop eating all the sulfur. Sulfur, it comes from amino acids, methionine and cysteine. And if you took a look at the sulfur content of various foods, same number of calories, same amount of protein. It just has to do with the, uh, the amount of sulfur containing amino acids. You find that beef provides four times more sulfur than do pinto beans. Eggs four times more than corn. Cheese five times more than white potatoes. You ever heard of cutting the cheese? Chicken seven times more than rice. Tuna 12 times more than sweet potatoes. Sulfur smells like something died, ladies and gentlemen. Sulfur stinks. When it comes as a sulfur, as a sulfur, as a hydrogen sulfide compound. But not, not, not all sulfur compounds stink. I mean, you may be thinking right now about onions and, and garlic. I mean, how, about, how about those kinds of sulfur compounds, which are different? Uh, those kinds of sulfur compounds, they have a whole other relationship with the body. Now, the, uh, the effect of uh, trimethylamine on body odor, as well as all the sulfur, has been tested, where they uh, took men and they put it for two weeks on a a high meat diet or a no meat diet. And they asked him to wear the same t-shirt every day. And then they handed the t-shirts to 33 women and asked him how they would rate the smell of men, whether they were on a high meat or a non-meat diet. And those who were on a non-meat diet were assessed as more attractive, more pleasant, less intensive in their reactions and personalities. Meat stinks, meat's repulsive. So there's one way you can get rid of the stink, you become more attractive. I have every reason to believe it's a reciprocal relationship. They just don't bother testing on women and see whether or not men like women who are on high meat or low meat diets. 
similar tests, similar tests done after a person eats garlic, which has sulfur containing compounds. Uh, you can see the picture of the uh, diallele disulfide in garlic. You can see there's a chemical, different chemical structure. Onions would be the same thing. Then we would get from the animal sources of, uh, of sulfur. And they did an experiment where they either fed raw garlic or garlic capsules to male donors. And then they had 82 women evaluate their smell, whether it was attractive or unattractive. And they perceived body odors as hedonistic when they ate sulfur. That means an odor of pleasure, attractiveness, masculinity, hedonistic. Oh, we did an experiment uh, in 2002 at our 10 day Libin program where I had my dentist, Dr. George Schneider come in and evaluate body odors from his point of view, which is of course, as a dentist would be halitosis. And he used a hell meter, which many of your dental offices have. When you go in and you complain of bad breath, they'll take and they'll stick this straw in your mouth and blow into a machine which measures, measures the volatile sulfur compounds. The ones that stink in your breath. And by the way, you can't wash it away or brush it away because once these sulfur compounds go in the gastrointestinal tract into the bloodstream, they, they, they float through the bloodstream until they get to the lungs and then they're exhaled in your breath. These same sulfur compounds, they end up in, on your skin. And they give you BO. They end up in your reproductive fluids and cause them to be malodorous. Of course, the end trip of uh, all the sulfur is is flatus, the bad farts. Anyway, what we found, and Dr. Schneider, he did this measurement, is that in seven days on the McDougal diet, we caught the, cut the sulfur compounds that were exhaled by our patients in half. So you wanna be more attractive? You wanna smell good? You know how to fix it, because you're not gonna cover it up. I don't care how much perfume, how much deodorant, how much uh, vaginal spray, how much whatever you consume, you aren't gonna cover it up. You gotta get rid of it. Okay, last last consideration is, are you vigor vigorous enough to have a relationship between man and woman that will be successful? Sexual intercourse. Well, you know, sexual intercourse, of course, involves physical activity. A sex therapist survey said that uh, seven to 13 minutes of intercourse was desirable. One to two minutes is too short. 30 minutes is too long. And for a woman to reach orgasm takes on average 13 and a half minutes. But, but you gotta be able to, you gotta be able to withstand this vigorous activity for a successful exchange of genetic material. And how do you get this vigor? Uh, eat a healthy diet. Uh, the, the, the greatest example of endurance and strength that's available has to do with gladiators. Gladiators. Uh, what was determined was the gladiator's diet based upon the finding of skeletons in a place called Ephesus, which is modern day Turkey. They found this graze plot and uh, 60 skeletons were found and about half of them were gladiators and they could tell they were gladiators by the fact that they were buried with swords and shields and tridents and many of them had trident holes in their skulls. Gladiators, the most vigorous men that have ever lived on this planet were also known as the barley men. And based upon examining the bones of these gladiators, they determined that they were vegan. They lived on a diet of barley and beans. Why did they live on a diet of barley and beans? Because losing in the Colosseum was not a good thing. And not only were the gladiators concerned about winning, but so were their owners. And the owners didn't ask the gladiators, which by the way, were the rock stars at the time, they could have anything they wanted except for the food. 
That was determined by the owners, just like if you are the owner of a racehorse at the Kentucky Derby. You don't ask your horse what he or she wants to eat. You want them to win. You feed them the diet that will best cause them to be strong and enduring, don't you? How uh, about the modern day gladiators? You know, starch eaters win. Of the long-term endurance events that have been performed in the last 50 years, 40% of the winners have been Kenyans and Ethiopians. In the Boston Marathon, which was the most recent marathon that I'm aware of, we had a winner from Ethiopia, a winner from Kenya. And what is their diet? Well, if you look at uh, Runner's World magazine and uh, various other periodicals that uh, look at the, the, the health of endurance athletes, what you find is that they live on a diet that's starch-based. In the case of Ethiopians and Kenyans, they eat a uh, they eat a traditional dish called ugali, which is basically a corn porridge, and that's what they attribute to their ability to win is on based upon the food. Certainly, I think gladiators and marathon runners and winners, in that case, male or female, gladiators were all male, would have the the strength and endurance to get through 13 minutes of vigorous sexual activity, don't you think? Uh, what, we've had contact with many athletes. So I just want to uh, bring out uh, a relationship I had with one of the world's most famous athletes and that was Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis, I, I met him uh, on a show called Twin Cities Live in St. Paul, Minneapolis in Minnesota. We were about ready to go on on this uh, morning talk show and Carl and his entourage walked in and Carl was complaining. He says, you know, I'm overweight. I'm like you're overweight. He says, yeah, you know, an ounce or two, which makes me not get the kind of times that I'd like to have. And every time I go on a diet, I either get sick or I lose my energy. I said, hey, Carl, try this. So I gave Carl a copy of the book that I was promoting at that time, which was the McDougall program, 12 Days to Dynamic Health. And Carl Lewis went home and followed it. And half the Santa Monica track team went on the McDougall diet. And, you know, as a consequence, and if you read this Runner's World magazine, August of 1992, he'll tell you. He'll tell you the reason he set the 100 meter dash was because of the diet I put him on. The reason he set three long jump records that as far as I know, haven't been top since the reason he won various marathons is because of the diet that he ate. He was 30 years old at that time. He retired at age 36. You want to listen to an interview of Carl Lewis talking about the McDougal diet and how it changed his life. You can do that on my website. It's very enjoyable discussion. Okay, finally, let me just tell you how wrong things are. Let me just, just tell you how misguided we are in terms of food choices. And I, I must be specific in my discussion about uh, the male men and male anatomy. There's a uh, organ that has a, everything to do with male reproduction. Uh, it's uh, involves the, in fact, it's, it's, it's a, it's a anatomical structure it involves the prostate and uh, also the testicles and also a couple of sacs that store semen, a, a semen, the fluid that keeps the sperm alive and healthy. These uh, sacs are called vas, seminal, seminal vesicles. And I want you to listen to these words carefully. Human males have seminal vesicles, but no other meeting animal has these important collecting pouches as part of the reproductive anatomy. So is it that is it that somehow we are designed incorrectly? Look at a cat. Cat doesn't have seminal vesicles. You know, cows do, horses do, monkeys do, human beings do. We were eating the wrong food based on our anatomy. I would think so. Even our sexual anatomy tells us this, doesn't it? 
Uh, you want to improve your desirability, your attractiveness in all kinds of relationships, but ladies and gentlemen, it's the food. It's, and I invite all of you to visit our website at drmcdougall.com and you can learn about the McDougall diet for free. The recipes, the instructions, what you do, all the details. There's a 12 day program, you can do it for free at drmcdougall.com. Uh, but if you're, you wanna get real serious about it and you're just tired of, of the inconvenience of being sick and ugly, we'll help you. We run a, uh, a 12 day internet-based telemedicine, telehealth program. You can take it in any place in the world. I had a lady from Africa yesterday asked me, could she take the program? Well, of course you can. Even though your time zones are completely different, of course you can. We vary our schedule to meet yours all around the world. We have people from China, from Korea, from Russia, from Africa, all over the world who take the program. And they judge the program as being more effective than the resort-based programs that we've run for 34 years. Well, Mary and I are in mid seventies. We're attractive at least to each other. If you want a similar attractiveness, you appreciate what you're seeing right here, then you need to take good care of yourself. You need to eat the foods that make you look good and smell good and make you active and enduring and so that you can do all the things that you should and wanna do. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, no mystery, costs nothing, no side effects, good for the planet. And that is, you fix the food. I'm Dr. John McDougall. It's been a pleasure talking to you on your birthday. <laughs>